Welcome to Living from the Soul. This is your host, Sam Tarod, and today I'm happy to be speaking with James Marcus. James is a former editor of Harper's Magazine, and he was also one of the early employees of Amazon.com. He's written a memoir titled Amazonia about his experiences there. His articles have appeared in the Atlantic Monthly, the New York Times Book Review, The Nation, and many other publications. But I wanted to talk with James because we both share Ralph Waldo Emerson as our intellectual hero. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation about Emerson's life, work, and continued relevance. Well, James, I've watched the video of yours, the lecture about Ralph Waldo Emerson. I've read a few of your articles, but I don't know that much about your background. Are you a teacher or? I'm a teacher at the moment. I'm teaching the personal essay at NYU, which, you know, is the Emersonian form. So I suppose I can't get away from him. Um, <laughs> but I've been a, a writer, editor, translator for most of my professional career. I've edited everything from, from Harper's Magazine most recently to uh, textbooks for fourth graders about the history of Arkansas and pressing matters like that. Uh, I'm a translator of Italian literature, so I've translated six or seven books and various articles and so forth. As a writer, you know, something of a multitasker. I started out doing quite a lot of criticism, let's say reviewing cultural criticism about music and about books. I've written some fiction, although not a great quantity of it. And then, you know, at this point in my life, I'm very energized and excited by various forms of nonfiction and particularly by, by the essay, which, you know, brings me back to Emerson once again. Great. What years were you at Harper's? Uh, I was at Harper's from 2010 to 2018. I started there as the deputy editor and then became the executive editor, which was basically the same job, different title. And then I became the editor-in-chief in 2016, and I, I did that for a couple of years. Uh, it was, you know, an amazing privilege to helm a magazine like that with such a distinguished history. Um, we didn't part on the best of terms, but, you know, these things happen. And the nice thing about that anyway is that it shifted the, the balance of my professional life away from primarily editing back to primarily writing. And for that, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. And then the teaching thing is a much more recent uh, activity and I'm enjoying it. Nice. Did Emerson ever write for Harper's? Emerson was more of an Atlantic Monthly man. And of course, he and, he and Margaret Fuller started the dial, but he wrote more for the Atlantic, which was the fact that hurt me very much during <laughs> the years that, that I was at Harper's. There's a very funny quote from Emerson somewhere. I don't remember where I came across it. There was a club in Boston of literary men called the Atlantic Club, which must have been in some way associated with the magazine, which was Boston based. But he said he, would just, he was at a meeting of the Atlantic Club, all men of course, and the latest issue of the Atlantic was delivered to them. And he said every person sat down and immediately read his own article in the magazine. <laughs> so some things in literary life never change, I guess. I'm, I'm sure that's still the basic situation. All right. Well, you've contributed to the Atlantic Monthly, correct? Uh, yes, I have. Not recently, but I, I certainly have, yeah. Nice. So you and Emerson have that in common. Yeah, I like to feel that, yes. And I know you were an early employee at Amazon, and you've written a memoir called Amazonia about your years there. Now, I make my entire living off Amazon, self-publishing books there, so I'm not going to criticize Amazon. Mm -hmm. Good for you. <laughs> I do have an, a suggestion, though, for Jeff Bezos. I think he should dedicate himself to preserving the Amazon rainforest. Think of the publicity of Amazon saving the Amazon. I think that's a great idea. And I've often wondered, I don't know, every time there's some beleaguered cultural institution or a great cause that could use some money, I just feel like when you've acquired wealth at that scale, almost any commitment of wealth is kind of meaningless. Hmm. You know, he could commit a hundred billion, he could, well, a hundred billion might be a little bit of a drag on his, uh, <laughs> his pocketbook, but I mean, he could commit a billion dollars to, to you know, ameliorating the situation in the Amazon rainforest. And it would be like the change on your night table, you know, for you or me. Um, actually, he does, to give him credit, seem to be diving more wholeheartedly into the philanthropic waters now, which he didn't for a long time. So maybe he'll, maybe he'll hear this podcast and uh, 
and heed your advice. <laughs> Great. I think he's perhaps a little inspired by Ray Bradbury. And I had a previous episode about Bradbury, one of my favorite writers. He was big on Mars exploration and the idea of setting up a colony on Mars. Oh, yeah. No, that's very big with these guys. It's interesting, actually, the extent to which, look, we all knew nerds when we were kids who were like giant Star Trek fans and fascinated by everything scientific. And for most of those people, it's not practical to simply enact those daydreams when they're adults. But for people like, you know, Elon Musk or, or Jeff Bezos or uh, the Virgin Atlantic guy, Richard Branson, it's like these guys, they entered adulthood as unreconstructed nerds. They amassed giant fortunes, and now they can simply carry out their childish daydreams in a way that's <laughs> kind of impressive. Uh, yeah. Well, tell me a little about the book you're working on right now about Emerson. Sure, sure. Uh, I've been working on this book for a long time. I actually signed a contract for it um, in 2013, which is actually kind of a long time ago. Yeah. I became fascinated with Emerson, let's say, in the late 90s. I was living in Seattle. I was working for Amazon at the time. It was a very demanding job. And the rest of my life was rather stressful as well. I was then married. My wife was having some chronic health problems. We had a you know, three, four-year-old son who was you know, coping with the ripple effects of having parents who were having stress and difficulties. And um, I had an old Penguin edition of Emerson's essays, you know, a paperback, beat up old paperback which I hadn't investigated very much, but I picked it up and began to read it as a kind of a way to soothe myself in the evenings. And you, you wouldn't think of Emerson really as someone you would turn to for consolation in the sense that he's not really a personal essayist. His, his work is, is exhilarating, but it's not at a very personal, cozy, immediate register for many readers. But there was something about it that really hooked me. And I think it was the elation you feel from reading the, the transcendental moments in his work. There was a, just a thrill to that. There was an exhilaration to it. I then began to read more about him. I read his letters. I read several excellent biographies about Emerson. And I just got very fascinated by him. I did not anticipate writing a book because I probably thought it, it would be a book of mainly academic interest in some way. And I think I was underestimating Emerson's very large presence in American culture in ways that are sometimes subterranean. You know, they don't necessarily have his brand name on them, but that so many aspects of how we behave as Americans, our civic life and our spiritual life, and even our personal life, like has a weird imprint of Emerson on it. Anyway, round about 2013, an agent I was having lunch with to talk about his clients for Harper's said to me out of the blue, have you ever considered writing a book on Emerson? <laughs> And I thought, oh, yeah, maybe someone would be interested. So I wrote a proposal, and he managed to sell it. And I'm sort of in the final phases of that book now, I'm happy to say. Uh, I hope in just a few more months to be done. It's not a biography, because there are several fantastic biography with biographies of Emerson written in the last few decades, really. I mean, he has, he's attracted tremendous biographers. You know, Robert D. Richardson, uh, Gabe Wilson Allen. Um, more focused studies like Evelyn Barish. I mean, I could go on and on. He's attracted really great biographers and scholars. And no one needs me to trot through every part of his life again. But what I am writing is um, a kind of a portrait of him, which consists of biographical episodes, usually paired with some part of his writing that I think is relevant to something that happened in his life. The relationship between those two things is not absolutely consistent. I mean, it's not always, here's something that happened to him, here's the kind of illustration in his work. But I want to write about the life and the work as completely intertwined. And I want, and really, I'm writing about the parts of his life and work that are the most exciting to me. And if I can convey that excitement, then the book will be a success. Um, it's by no means a complete picture of his life. There are large things that I've left out of it, and I don't discuss all of his work. Uh, Emerson himself often said that while well, he read a tr tremendous amount of stuff, all kinds of different you know, books. Um, later in life, he said, oh, I, I, I read for the lusters, meaning I just read for the pithiest, most quintessential bits of brilliance. And in a way, I've tried to take the lusters out of his life and his work and put them together to write this book. So 
Yeah, what you said at the end there reminds me, in The American Scholar, I think he speaks of taking the gold from a book and leaving the dross behind, you know, only only take those things that really resonate with you. And I know that's what I've tried to do in my own work with Emerson and the books I've made paraphrasing his philosophy. My experience is similar to yours in that I really became interested in Emerson when I was going through a high stress situation, going through divorce about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I found the same thing as you, that reading his work was very consoling. The world is is a right when you're reading an Emerson essay Mm -hmm. or book. It's what the words do to your mind and consciousness. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Emerson's register as an essayist is, is in some ways quite formal and lofty. So, you know, sometimes when I recommend his work to people, I really, I think they're expecting the sort of personal essay that people write now, which is often an episode from their own life, which is illustrative of something, you know, or, or and, and Emerson doesn't really do that. It's quite rare that he will introduce his personal experience in any detail into his own work. And of course, then when he does it, in an essay like Experience, where he writes even briefly about the death of his son Waldo, it's tremendously powerful because you don't, you don't really expect it. And you really feel like you're seeing straight into the heart of this human being because he doesn't usually do that. He doesn't sort of part the curtains for you in that way. I've come to appreciate his lectures perhaps even more than the essays. I feel those are a little looser, mm-hmm. a, little more, a little more first person. Of course, the relationship between his journals and his lectures and his essays is, of course, very porous because both the lectures and the essays usually came out of material that were in the journals. And particularly later in his career, many of the things that turned into lectures then turned into slightly more formalized versions of the lectures and were published as essays. But I've been writing um, recently about his career as a lecturer, which is really interesting. And in some ways, it feels a little paradoxical because he was such an internal person that the idea that he spent decades as a performer speaking to other people and to sometimes demanding audiences who would walk out if they did not enjoy the show um, (laughs) is very funny. The idea of him being such a public person. Um, But I think it probably had a a healthy effect on his writing. Having to address an audience in real time was probably kind of good for him because I think one of the dangers of as such a subjective and transcendental approach to writing is a kind of solipsism, you know, a kind of compartmentalizing of yourself and sealing off the rest of the world. But when you're in a, you know, a room of demanding customers, you know, somewhere in Minnesota or Michigan, you know, and then it's 10 degrees below zero, you know, you've got to really work the room and you have to, you know, connect with those people. And I think even in his loftiest lectures, there's much more of a desire to connect with an audience and speak to them in language they can understand. It's funny reading the reviews of those lectures. Some people just found them baffling, while others absolutely loved them and were mesmerized. It's fascinating, isn't it? You realize that those two people were in the same room. You know, they saw the same movie, but one person just found it incomprehensible, and the other, for the other person, it was a transcendent experience. You know, they were, they were taken out of themselves and shown a glimpse of paradise. And for the other person, it was like, I could not understand a word. And it tells you something about individual taste, of course, but it does also tell you that for the right listener, Emerson was an amazing experience as a lecturer. You know, he wasn't a showy lecturer. You know, he was on a circuit that included many like comedians and speakers who were much more demonstrative in their approach to the audience. And he famously just stood there um, he kind of would raise his fist up and down a little bit. I think it was a major event in his lecture when he shifted his weight from one boot to the other and you could hear it creak. But he spoke in a baritone in a pretty straightforward way. He didn't yell or shout. The other thing that I've discovered, which I find really interesting, is that he was a little more of an improviser as a lecturer and would sort of hop back and forth through the pages he had written, change the order things were in quite, I'm assuming sometimes change the phrasing or experiment with how he was saying something. So there was a sense of a kind of a jazz performance going on where the audience could see to some extent that he was improvising a little bit. And that must have made it very interesting as well. It's a little hard to imagine. 
I, I wish there was some footage, but unfortunately, yeah. it, it was pre-video, so. Yeah. I've also enjoyed reading his sermons, especially in the, in the early years, he's more traditional in his messages. They're pretty conventional Unitarian Christian sermons. Yeah. Then especially in the, the final ones, he becomes much more daring. His theology is more unorthodox. And I'm surprised by how many of his later essays are prefigured in those sermons. He had yeah. developed these ideas quite early on that he would continue to work with for the rest of his life. Oh, he absolutely did. Yeah, and, and I think the real Emerson comes more and more to the fore as you, as you read his sermons. I think you're quite right that the earlier ones are in a much more conventionally Unitarian framework, and there'll be little felicities of language. But of course, the Unitarians themselves were known for sort of an, an elegant style. And he was operating more in that rhetorical world. But yeah, the real Emerson comes through more and more. And even just the fundamental transcendentalist idea that your intuitive understanding of the universe was the most important one is already coming out in his lectures. The idea that, that God is in you to be discovered, and that's an individual matter in some way, and that the sort of tribalistic approach to God, the wholesale rather than retail approach to God that was part of institutionalized religion. He's beginning to float those ideas even when he is still operating within institutionalized religion and is the minister with his own flock. So I think some of the inconsistencies were floating to the surface, as you say, then. And of course, you know, he finally broke with Unitarianism and stepped down from the pulpit uh, over, the, over the issue of communion you know, over the issue of whether communion was to be taken literally or metaphorically. And for him, it was metaphorical. And that was not deemed acceptable. And I think he wasn't able to sort of skate over that inconsistency. He took what he was doing seriously enough to say, like, I, I can't do it anymore. But I would also think that the, all the other inconsistencies between his private belief and his public belief were beginning to tear him away from being a Unitarian minister. I was surprised to see one of his later sermons is all on the theme of self-reliance. Yeah, exactly. Quite so a few lines, yeah, quite yeah. a few lines make it into the essay, the famous essay, Self-Reliance. Exactly, exactly, exactly as you say. He was already on the flight path while he was a minister. And of course, we have to remember that um, he didn't want to be a minister for most of his early life. The Emersons came from six generations of ministers, there was enormous pressure on he and his, and his brothers to become a minister. And also because after the death of Emerson's father, they were essentially pauperized as a family. Emerson's older brother, William, was the first one to give it a shot. The family scraped together their money and sent him to Gottingen, which is the great theological powerhouse of the day in Germany. And he washed out. You know, he, he, he had a crisis of faith. Similar way as his brother, Ralph Waldo Emerson, could not carry out a theological mission in which he did not believe, William Emerson couldn't do it. He lost his faith. He came back to America. He went to Staten Island and became an attorney and then a judge. You know, and then it was, it was Waldo's turn to do this. And um, he sort of reluctantly did it. You know, he took on the family mantle. He went into the family business, you could say but with great reluctance and you know, very slowly and had to sort of be pressured into it. And then even once he was ordained and got, you know, became the head of the, of the second church, he didn't do it for that long. These contradictions came out pretty soon. And of course the death of his first wife was, this, was another crushing blow at the same time. And I think he just was a very damaged individual personally and theologically, and he, he had to step down and regroup. Yeah. My book, Living from the Soul, focuses on that period where he's, his wife dies, he quits the church, and then travels to Europe and learns a great deal over there. That seems to me the central hinge of his life or turning point. Would you call it that? Yeah, no, no, I would agree with you. That's when he turned into himself, I think, in some way. I mean, he was obviously himself in a nascent form before that, but, you know, the Emerson we know and love who wrote the exhilarating things that he wrote. I think that transformation really took place in that period that you're talking about. And I mean, I think he really had the equivalent of a kind of nervous breakdown. He sort of came apart under the twin hammer blows of grief and very deep theological and existential unease. 
you know, and he had, he had sort of health problems. It's clearly he, that he was even drinking more, you know, than he would for the rest of his life. And then he took this trip to Europe and came back a kind of rejuvenated person with actually sort of the outline for nature, like in the pocket of his coat. You know, he started to work on it in Liverpool, I believe, while he was waiting for his boat. And then on the boat itself, he, he writes a letter basically saying, you know, I have a, a kind of a sketch of my book in my pocket. So it's amazing to see the recognizable, beloved Emerson board the return ship, ready to commence his real life. And not that it was a life without complication or, or, or difficulty, but um, he's really commencing his life as the Emerson that we kind of know and love. I know I identify a lot with his theological struggles and the changes he went through because I grew up fundamentalist Christian, then in college was more agnostic or unsure of things and ended up joining the Orthodox Church for a while because I felt that tradition was what was needed. I actually uh, disliked Emerson at that time because he was so anti-tradition. Yeah. And, and I thought, no, we, we need tradition. We can't be trusted to find truth on our own. But eventually I came around and it hinged on the, this idea of literal versus metaphorical, which, which you brought up. That was really the hinge for me when I learned to see religious language as metaphorical. Then my entire perspective and life transformed. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason I really resonate with Emerson. That's, that's fascinating, actually. And of course, fundamentalism is the, is the literalism. That's almost at the heart of it, you know. And I mean, Emerson's relationship to Unitarianism, even after he left the church, and to Christianity is by no means just oppositional. You know, he, he remained a Christian by his own definition for the rest of his life. The difference is that he considered Christ a font of extraordinary wisdom, an extraordinary human being, but not the Son of God, which is where the Unitarians were already going anyway. That was basically aligned with what Unitarians thought. Unitarianism being, in a way, a much more rational, Enlightenment-flavored version of Congregationalism. But the interesting thing about Unitarianism is that although they were a much more rational and science-oriented version of uh, Congregationalism, they made an exception for miracles. They were still willing to believe in certain miracles, even though that flew in the face of their other professed ideas. Uh, and I've always found that kind of fascinating. And it's actually another reason that Emerson's useful exposure to John Locke and then to David Hume was intensely disturbing to him. Because Locke, who was a huge influence, not just on Unitarians, but sort of on the whole revolutionary generation, he was a rationalist who also left room for miracles. And by the time you got to David Hume, Hume simply did not really think that that was going to go. As well as Hume's drastic undermining of the idea that the real world is, is genuine, Emerson found all of those challenges very disturbing, emotionally disturbing, as well as just a kind of intellectual game. And to some extent, you can he wrestles with that for the rest of his life. For, for how real is the real world? How, how real are we? He says at one point, maybe an experience, I think he says, well, maybe we should treat men and women as if they were real, and perhaps they are. You know, which is a joke, but which reflects, I think, a genuine unease on his part. Now, I see that I've rambled somewhat far away from your original point, but Emerson does make yes. you do that. He's a, he's a great rambler. <laughs> Toward the end of Nature, his first major book, he talks about miracles, I think in terms of the power of belief, what, mm -hmm. we, would, what we today would call a positive thinking or you know, the kind of faith healing type miracles. So it seemed in that sense, he did believe in miracles. He did. And also there's a strong implication of, of mind over matter mm -hmm. in, a, in a book like Nature. And I've you know, spent some time pondering how literal he meant that to be. Mm -hmm. you know, because he basically talks about the power of the human mind and the power of human consciousness to not only perceive nature, but to shape it. Now, you can line that up, of course, with sort of post-Heisenberg thinking about the, the, the capacity of an observer to affect the thing that is being observed. So in some ways, it seems very prescient and an anticipation of certain kind of quantum mechanics thinking and so forth. I don't literally think that Emerson felt in some Yuri Geller manner that he could control the weather with his thinking or... Uh, bend a pewter spoon in half. 
I think, again, that it's a more metaphorical way of talking about the enormous power of human consciousness to perceive the world so intensely that in a way you are, you are changing it or not quite manufacturing it, but that perception is, is a way of simultaneously understanding and creating in your brain. But that's not the same thing either as the kind of having a telekinetic power over nature. So that's the part of Emerson that can also seem absurd at times because you think, well, he can't really believe that. But I think a lot of times he, he believes it metaphorically with great passion. And that's what you're feeling. On the other hand, Swedenborg was a very early influence of his. That's someone who argues for the literal existence of parallel worlds and alternate worlds. You know, there's, the, there's the, the world that you can see, the world of perception. And then there's the world of spirit, which you can sometimes glimpse through the world of material things. And that was enormously influential when he was writing Nature. And even though he, he lost some patience with Swedenborg, he still put him in representative men as well. So he never totally put aside those ideas either. And I suppose, although I'm a more materialist person, a more empirical person, there's something in that that attracts me, whether you want to call it metaphorical or just the idea that there, that there are moments of intense perception where you think that you are seeing and understanding more than you usually do, it feels very real to me. So in that sense, I guess I'm willing to take parts of Emerson literally. All right. Well, with Emerson's idealism, it's difficult for me to wrap my head around sometimes, but basically the idea is that consciousness or mind is really all that exists. And what we, everything that we sense is within that realm of consciousness. So the physical world only exists within consciousness. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the conclusion of neuroscience now. You know, all of these years later, I think that's sort of a, that's a very mainstream understanding in terms of neuroscience and neurobiology that there's a kind of continuous show, you know, in your brain. And your brain is this sort of amazing computational device, which is just taking in sense data and assembling it into some kind of simulation. Now, part of us just rebels against that idea because because it's very disquieting, first of all, to think that it's true. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, it just raises questions about, well, what is your relationship to the world around you? And in a way, you can car- compartmentalize that idea and just say, well, that makes a lot of sense. That's really cool. But meanwhile, I'm sitting in an actual chair and I'm drinking a glass of water. And these are not spectral phenomena. There's something that's, you know, they're real. I'm sitting on something real. I think it's in a way very Emersonian to hold both of those ideas in your head at the same time to be walking through a spectral, non-real universe, but to, you know, as Emerson did, smoke your cigar and leave the butt on the fence post and then go have pie for breakfast. I mean, I don't think he thought those were uh, exercises in the ideal. I think he also took a hedonist pleasure in doing those things. So for me, it's like I, I have all, I try to cultivate all those understandings at once. Yeah. And there is a remarkable passage in one of Emerson's lectures where he sort of gives himself an out And he says, either mind is an exceedingly fine form of matter or matter is an exceedingly fine form of mind. (laughs) So either way, either way it works. No, he was very good at finding those formulations. I mean, you have to remember that this was a guy who loved to um, bend down and look through his legs and perceive the world upside down. And he wrote a famous passage about how edifying that was (laughs) uh, just as a form of mental instrumentation to look at the world upside down. And I think he meant it, but also it's, a, it's just a rhetorical habit of his to like turn everything on its head and to examine it truly and earnestly to see if the opposite is true. So that's a great passage that you pointed out where he kind of got to have his cake and eat it too. Yeah, um, yeah to me, that's the mark of an amazing mind. And I, I don't think it's a, it's not a parlor trick. You know, it's not a cheap trick. It's something profound. It's saying that you can have, you know, multiple and possibly contradictory understandings of the thing at the same time. Mm-hmm. And I, I've really taken that away from Emerson. It's, it's really affected the way I think about things as well. That you foreclose all sorts of thoughts if you cling too dogmatically to one. So you can just see him. I mean, the journals themselves are this endless factory for the trying out of every possible thought and every possible position. And he takes arguments that are often completely contradictory, you know, in the same passage. Not because he doesn't feel that any of them are true and not because he's dodging, 
I just think he feels like it's his intellectual obligation to take everything for a test drive somehow. Hmm. And it's, an, it's a very attractive part of his personality. And some of these things seem like just philosophical debates or up in the air concepts, materialism and idealism. But really his focus was very practical. And I think that's why among philosophers, his work is so appealing to me. It's not just thought experiments and mind games. It's very practical. And what do you think of that side of Emerson as a practical philosopher? Well, I mean, I would agree with you in the sense that so much of his work was driven by these, these fundamental questions of like, who are we? Where do we find ourselves? What is our relationship to the universe? And how do we live? So much of his work is this enormous, beautiful efflorescence from just those, those questions. I mean, my impression has been that sometimes Emerson is seen as, as a, a bit of a black sheep or dark horse, you know, choose your animal metaphor in the world of philosophy, because in some ways he's simply not systematic enough. Yeah. His openness to every opposing position makes him seem a little too chaotic to, you know, kind of a, someone who does philosophy for a living. But I think if we want to think, if we want to think of philosophy as also just the large humanistic discipline that asks how, how are we to live, then I think he's obviously a great American philosopher. And, you know, let's not forget the um, amount of really important American philosophy that flows out of Emersonianism, you know, start, starting, let's say, with William James, who to me is one of the most attractive American philosophers and who was Emerson's godson. He was literally Emerson's <laughs> godson, not his figurative godson. I mean, there's that amazing scene that I'm sure you're familiar with when Emerson, having recently lost his own son, Waldo, to scarlet fever, and in a terrible state of grief, goes to New York City. And he goes on a visit to his friend, Henry James Sr., the father of the novelist and the philosopher, who he, I think he had just met. He didn't know him that well. He went to his house in Washington Square and Henry James Sr. said, oh, I have a newborn child. Why don't you come up and meet him? And they go upstairs and there's William James as an infant in a crib, which by itself, I find a comic idea just to think about. <laughs> and evidently in some way, uh, Henry James Sr. said, you know, would you be sort of a godfather? So there's a, there's a genealogy there and a way of thinking that I think is transmitted very much to William James. Yeah. And out, you know, fanning out from William James into all many different aspects of American philosophy. Talking about William James reminds me, I think Emerson deserves more credit as one of the founders of psychology. I think yeah. he had qu quite a bit of influence and he was one of the first to be talking about the mind. Yeah, no, and I think he was, he was hugely interested also in, in the concept of the unconscious. Yeah. As a kind of, you know, ungovernable part of you which would also always surface, you know, that you, you couldn't really control it. And he was also quite aware of the mind as the unconscious mind as uh, the source of intuitive wisdom that you could not glean from any kind of rationalistic machine-like mulching of, your, of you know, what was happening in your life. So he is definitely um, an early psychologist. I, I would agree with that. And very scientific-minded. In fact, early on, he spoke of wanting to become a scientist. He said, I will be a naturalist. That's right. Well, he had his great epiphany at the French, when he was in Paris, in the Museum of Zoology. He has an amazing uh, an epiphany, is I guess the best word for it, looking at all the arrayed samples, seeing both their incredible particularity and beauty, but the, the sort of patterning of them. And, and, and really as though he were looking at a, a glossary, a, a sort of giant dictionary of the material world, which he also took as a kind of symbolic representation of a spiritual world. And he was a, an avid consumer of science and scientific literature throughout the rest of his life. And I think it's something else really distinctive about him. It shows an earlier and healthy idea about the humanities and letters as well, that they should not be siloed off from the sciences, that those two things were often speaking about the same thing in slightly different dialects. I think science was an inexhaustible source of metaphor and language and poetry for him. And he anticipated Darwin by a few decades in writing about evolution. In That's right. In nature, he talks about all things evolving from the first cell and speaks of the worm climbing the ladder to become man. Exactly. Yeah, there's that famous passage. Again, I think like these were for him, let's say they were poetic perceptions 
of how the universe worked, which have now been bizarrely borne out, you know, by subsequent science. And um, that's very heartening to me about the power of intuition and poetry that you could grasp those things without having any of the scientific substantiation of them. But you could have an instinct and you could express it in language that was somewhat poetic, but sometimes bizarrely accurate. And of course, he didn't have to wait. As, I mean, you know, these sort of neuroscientific insights are much more recent. But, you know, Darwin was closer in time to Emerson. So he could feel some of his instincts confirmed, I suppose, in Darwin's earliest writing. I don't know if Emerson ever read the mature Darwin. I, I should know this, actually. Now I just can't remember. Yeah, I don't. Don't know either. I know he, he mentions them in passing once or twice. That's all I've come across. Mm -hmm. I think even in that image of the worm, isn't it the worm climbing the spire or yes. spiral to become man? And I think of how that spiral image reminds me of DNA. So this yep. is that poetic perception you're talking about. Yes, no, it reminds you of the double helix. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. So I think we have to give Emerson a lot of credit. It's funny, I mean, when you look at some of the the most wildly imaginative writers in different genres, you find sometimes these weird prescient understandings of things that would later become scientific. There are some things like that in Dante as well. Even in the Paradiso, the way he writes about light. I mean, and it's a very light-filled world he's describing. But because he's trying to find new and fresh and to him instinctively true poetic formulations to write about light, there are bits in there that are now seen as like, oh, that really prefigures our understanding of light as wave, particle. I'm sure Dante would have been very excited to know that he was right after all. Um, <laughs> so I guess, it, it'll, you know, this is great news for poets, that <laughs> poetry often precedes scientific understanding. I certainly wish Emerson were around to see DNA and quantum physics and the comment oh on God, this. What he would have done with this material, yeah. I can only imagine. Let alone, what would Emerson have done with Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> Probably you know, nothing. You know, I hope well, nothing. It might be nothing. That could be nothing. But, you know, he was a person whose unit of thought was the sentence. He really was a great sentence writer. I don't think he was overly concerned with kind of linear movement in paragraphs or indeed in entire essays, because that was not his MO. He was this fashioner of transcend transcendental sentences, you know, of, of just amazing beauty and pungency and memorability and, and wit. Probably most of them would fit into the 140 character limit, although many of them would not. So um, luckily we don't have to have an answer to that. But I think you're right that the whole panoply of contemporary science um, would have, he would have loved it. He would have loved every moment of it. You touched on his anti-slavery speeches and writings. Do you think that makes him uniquely relevant to this moment? Or there's certain things he wrote against the fugitive slave law and such that when you read them now, it applies to the headlines today. Oh my God, yes. I mean, his, his anger at the fugitive slave law was um, in a way kind of a breaking point for him. I mean, the amount of emotion he poured both into dozens and dozens of journal pages that were just about that, just about his reaction to the fugitive slave law. And then uh, the speeches he began to give publicly, you sense that it was the iniquity of, not only the iniquity of slavery, but the necessity to fight it in the real world and not in the world of ideas was suddenly glaringly apparent to him because I think he had a long and fascinating evolution on the question of, of abolition because I mean, from the time he was a teenager, he thought slavery was wrong. He was never a person who thought it was morally correct to have slaves. Of course, there were no slaves in Massachusetts when he was growing up. Yeah. It, had been, it had been outlawed in his own state long before. There were um, some black people, free black people living in Concord, but you know, all things considered, Emerson did not have contact with an enormous number of black people in, in his youth and in his early adulthood. He always knew slavery was wrong, but I think it seemed very abstract to somebody in his position. And if you really think that what you're doing as a writer is bringing about a great transformation in consciousness, then in a way, retail politics seems a little pointless to you. You know, why knock on doors and distribute pamphlets and put out an abolitionist newspaper when the revolution of consciousness will solve that problem unto itself? In other words, 
by that logic, everyone will recognize the immorality of slavery and it will collapse under its own wicked weight. And if you think that's going to happen, that's a very attractive idea. But I think Emerson gradually saw that it was not going to happen, that mind over matter would not bring about the end of slavery and that you, it had to be fought to the nail in the arena of retail politics. And so while he was not a person who relished going at it in the trenches of political life, he did begin to, you know, publish very fiery abolitionist uh, speeches and articles, and he began to give speeches, you know, um, which I think was not his nature. It was not his temperamental tendency to go and speak at, you know, at the Masonic Temple or whatever in Boston and have crowds hissing and yelling at him. But he did it because he recognized finally it, that it had to be done. And he relished the Civil War when it broke out. You know, he's, he famously noted some, sometimes gunpowder smells good. Um, because I, he, he recognized that that struggle was necessary. And of course, for me, it's a great relief to have my hero end up in the right spot. Right. Uh, but there are times early on when he, you know, he writes things that make him seem remarkably callous towards the suffering of actual enslaved people. I also think that he was very allergic to what we would now call the sort of virtue signaling, you know, the, the performance of that sort of virtue. And so he tended to recoil from reformers because he felt that it, to a great degree, it was about this performance of virtue. And he felt these people care about slaves who live 500 miles away, but they don't care about the people in their own neighborhood. Undoubtedly, that was true for some of them, but it also put Emerson in the, to me, awkward and sometimes ugly position of dumping on the abolitionists who I think were fighting a heroic battle. It's almost like his fastidiousness kept him away from seeing the work they were doing. But, but then eventually he did recognize it, you know, and he consorted with, you know, uh, Garrison and other prominent abolitionists and had them speak from his pulpit. I mean, I think he ended up totally on the right side of history, but it's an interesting evolution. And in a way, he was also prodded along by his own wife, by Lydian. Uh, the women in Concord really were in the vanguard of the anti-slavery and abolitionist movement. And there's a, there's a famous incident, I forget what year it was, where it was the 4th of July and they were celebrating in Concord and Lydian wanted to hang black crepe fabric on the front of their house and a kind of pall to say that we shouldn't really be celebrating independence in this country until we have eradicated this stain. And, and it was her idea. Emerson kind of consented to it and, you know, sort of chuckled over it, but like it was her idea to do it. And I think he was prodded along by the intensity of, of his wife's um, anti-slavery beliefs and good for her. It was true in the Thoreau household as well, that the women in the household were ahead of the curve. And of course, Thoreau became, you know, quite a fierce anti-slavery guy himself. Yeah, well, that's dynamic is still true today with the <laughs> well, women's yes, march. So. Yes, it, in many a household, I would totally agree with you uh, yeah. that it is, very much true, yeah. And in that sense too, like those struggles seem today's struggles. You know, those yeah. dynamics are today's dynamics. And Emerson being someone who always hated the abstraction of slavery, but didn't grapple with it directly. He is a million people now today who have always disapproved of racism, uh, but have remained on the sidelines in terms of doing anything, you know. Right. It's the struggle that I think, you know, millions of us are in the midst of now. And so, Emerson's evolution, I hope, is, will be interesting to people who are going through some version of that same evolution now. Mm -hmm. I think it's in one of the Fugitive Slave Law lectures where he brings up the concept of self-reliance and asks himself the question, well, aren't these Southerners using self-reliance? Aren't they relying on their own insights and such and their instincts to go along with slavery? And he makes a distinction and says that self-reliance is reliance on God or the, the divine within. So I found it interesting that he realized his work could be critiqued in that way. And yeah. he, saw, he saw perhaps the abuses of self-reliance that are certainly possible. Um, yeah. Well, I think, again, this goes back to your, the earlier formulation of as you brought up. I mean, I think in the most earnest way, he's having a little bit both ways. You know, I mean, you can say... Well, ultimately, the wisdom, our sense of morality comes from God. And then you can say, well, God is within each of us, which circularly brings us back a little bit to, so therefore it's up to you. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he was certainly aware that if every human being was free to be a lawgiver, 
there was room for abuse, uh, no question about it. But I think he also felt that every human being had to have a, an intuitive sort of some kind of self-governing sense of right and wrong. And you could say it was overly optimistic of Emerson to feel that everyone, if they really plumbed those, those, the depths of morality, we would come to the same conclusion. I think he felt there was something in you that would feel the right sort of shame if you did the wrong thing. I mean, there's a famous surreal phrase he has about Daniel Webster, who he felt had really spoiled himself by his role in the Compromises and the Fugitive Slave Act, and who had been, you know, a great hero of Emerson's and of Massachusetts. But once he dirtied his hands in this kind of political compromise, Emerson wrote, all the drops of his blood have eyes that look downward. That is a surreal piece of language, but an amazing image of shame. Basically saying he knows what he's doing is wrong. He hasn't really persuaded himself that this is right. He knows some intuitive sense inside knows that what he's what he's doing is wrong. And I've never forgotten that sentence, partly because it's just so bizarre. And it pops into my head often, you know, when, when I observe the political scene of right now, which I think is unusually full of shameful actors, mm-hmm. uh, of, people, of people intelligent enough to know that they're doing wrong. And I, I, really, I think of that phrase a lot. Uh, it's, you know, like, like many of Emerson's phrase, it gets into your head and it never leaves. Yeah, and one of my favorite concepts from Emerson is that great truths are self-evident. You know, he would just state things. He wouldn't footnote it or rely on an authority or a text. Yeah. This ties in with what you're saying about conscience also. And it's, are, is that really true? Are great truths self-evident? Do people have an internal guidance system? And I think he would say, overall, when you look at the best thinkers of the past, they do agree on morality. Things like do unto others as you would have mm-hmm. them do unto you. And, as you reap, you will sow. Yeah, I think there are certain underlying principles that most honest people gravitate toward. Having said that, it's hard to look at human behavior sometimes and feel that those that the inner compass is all that effective. I mean, I, I try to look on the bright side. It's hard sometimes in the modern world to do that. It doesn't make me feel myself that people who are doing what I think are terrible things are beyond some kind of redemption. I don't think that, but I don't always have a handy answer as to how you, how you affect that. Like, how do you reach in and connect with what I feel has to be some sort of core of decency? Uh, and, and maybe that, maybe I'm just naive. I mean, Emerson has been accused many times since his heyday of being naive, you know, of being too sunny in his assessment of human nature and human potentiality. You could say that's true. I mean, I, I think he was also very aware of the, of the darkness and deviousness and awfulness that human beings are capable of, but I think he preferred to dwell on the, on the potentiality for, you know, decency and goodness and, and, and kindness. Anyway, I, that puts me into a cul-de-sac that I, that I don't really have the answer for. But, and I, I mean, I would also say that self-reliance, which I think is a beautiful and useful and essential concept and which no one has ever preached with more beauty than Emerson has sometimes in American life been a very negative thing when taken to its extreme. Yeah. And we're, we're seeing that we see that like every day now, particularly in a political culture as fractured as ours is that, you know, the reductio ad absurdum of self-reliance is a completely atomized world in which there is no state and there is no tribe and there is no congregation and every single person is singular and unto himself or herself. And, you know, that translates in the political sphere into an obsession with individual rights, a feeling that the group must never prevail in its interests over individuals, that every individual should have a hundred guns in his or her house, that the federal government should never interfere with your power grid Some of my political convictions may be clear from these examples, but you don't really have to believe what I believe to see ways in which the cult of self-reliance can become exaggerated and grotesque. And it's part of American life. We can't eradicate it, really. It's sort of who we are. And it's one of those things I was alluding to earlier, that um, Emerson was not the only person to advance this gospel of self-reliance, but he did it more eloquently than anyone else, really. And I feel that it got into the cultural bloodstream in a way that has led to wonderful things about American life, but has also 
had its toxic outcomes sometimes. And that too makes them ter you know, t terribly relevant, you know, for worse and for better, very much both. So he, for me, he's just very present, very present in American life. He definitely had a balance with community in his own life. And perhaps in his era, perhaps the emphasis and the power was with the local community over individuals. So he needed to stress the, uh, the value of the individual perspective where in our own day, things are out of balance. The government and the community has been so looked down upon that now we need to build those things back up. Yeah, no, you, you may be right. I mean, I think Emerson was, and obviously all of these broad cultural generalizations have a million exceptions to them, but you, you still have to make them to understand the world. But, you know, you could argue that in many ways, Emerson was born into a very, let's say tribalistic world in the sense that congregationalism, a Puritanism, because congregationalism is American Puritanism really, was losing the sort of all governing grip it had on American life, but it was still quite strong. And he was still coming out of that culture where Americans were taught to move in, you know, like schools of fishes in a way. It was a very, it was a communitarian culture. And Emerson was reacting against that and then very specifically against what he thought was the group think of, of the institutionalized church. And I think for him to, to have that reaction and to articulate it so beautifully was perfectly appropriate. I mean, that said, it's not like he spurned every bit. I mean, he paid his taxes, unlike Thoreau. Um, you know, he was, if you go to Emerson's house in Concord, maybe you've been there, um, yeah. you know, hanging prominently in the entryway are these buckets and they're the fire buckets that are full of sand and everyone had them in their house because if there was a house burning in the, in the village, everyone ran there as a, as a community firefighting unit and everyone went and like threw their buckets of sand and water. And I thought that was a beautiful little token of the fact that like, yeah, Emerson was part of a community, you know, willingly. So, he, you know, he's contradictory in that way as in so many others. And maybe he liked those smaller community units. And of course, he was powerfully tempted, although he never gave in to the idea of going to Fruitland or Brook Farm or one of these basically utopian communities of the era, because this was a big, this was a big era for utopian communities. And his close friend, Bronson Alcott, started one and they all well, wanted Emerson to join yeah. and he did toy with it, you know, and Hawthorne famously went to Brook Farm and then wrote about it, you know, with the fictional cover in Blythdale Romance. Thoreau on his way back from his horrible tenure in New York City, which he just hated so deeply, you know, and as soon as he got like $10 he was owed for some poetry in the dial, he just left. But he, I think he stopped either, I, I forget whether it was Brook Farm or Fruitlands on the way back. And he too toyed with the idea of staying there. Um, I think that was very attractive to Emerson, even though he was supposed to hate community. I think in the end, it was just a little too much for him. <laughs> I think the yeah. idea of living in sort of a dormitory and just doing agricultural work all day and then like sharing a big bowl of porridge at five o'clock, like he could not do that. It was temperamentally too much of a problem. <laughs> but, he was, but he was attracted to it and he respected it, you know. As with all of these, what seemed to be ideas at antipodes, these sets of useful opposites, like the singular person versus the community, the world as illusion, the world as the real thing, like all of these polar opposites just played out for him. He sort of believed in both sides of them and usefully drifted back and forth at times. I'd like to feel that despite the fierceness of his rhetoric, it doesn't add up to Emerson saying, don't ever talk to any other people, go live in a cave. <laughs> and it was Thoreau who did that in a very yeah. controlled experiment kind of way. It wasn't Emerson who, li who went to live in a tiny hut. It was, it was Thoreau who, who sort of literalized Emerson's ideas for two years, even if he did walk home to have dinner with his family. So I don't know. But to return to my earlier point, I feel that Emerson's perpetual struggle with or engagement with community here and the holiness of the individual here is also an ongoing struggle in American yeah. life, a political and a cultural battle that just goes on and on because of who we are. Yeah. Personally, I think I resonate with Emerson's personality with what you were just saying of being attracted to these experimental communities, intentional communities, but also being a very solitary person. Sometimes I'm 
drawn to the idea of, oh, wouldn't it be great to be part of an Emersonian church, <laughs> some sort of community based on Emerson's spiritual principles? I guess today that would mean the Unitarians or the Unity Church seem to be the closest. When I visited churches, I just can't take it. I'd rather stay home alone on Sunday. But I mean, that's an utterly Emersonian statement. He maybe even said, when I visit churches, I just can't take it. But he also expressed his interest in churches that consisted of, of one person only. It's funny because it's a good joke, but it's also a real impulse. Like for Emerson, the self was a kind of one man band version of a church, you know, simply because he felt, as he also said, the every person should have an original relation to the universe. I mean, Th that's one of his most memorable utterances. And, I, and for me, it's very beautiful. But if you believe that, you don't need a church. You know, if you believe that it's always you forging your own original relationship to the cosmos, then a church is the kind of intermediary and, and a minister is the kind of simultaneous translator. But Emerson was saying, well, you, you don't need that. You just don't need it. Now that's also giving short shrift to the some of the other things that people get from church, which is a sense of community, you know, which is communion, you know. Emerson often didn't feel he needed that, although I think he did. I mean, I think that's part of the reason, aside from the money, that he spent all those decades lecturing, because he got communion out of it. He might not have put it that way, but he did explicitly say when he talked about lecturing that, I mean, I can't remember the exact phrase, but that it was a two-way interchange that the, both the audience and the speaker felt a kind of lightning and an electrical connection. It may have been the absence of that kind of communion in the rest of his writing life, so much of which was conducted by sitting in a rocking chair by himself, that he needed to get out and see other human beings. So maybe in a way, every time he gave a lecture, that was a, a transient version of a congregation. I mean, I'm like you. I, I mean, part of me is gregarious and likes to see other people, but there's a countermanding feeling that I must be alone <laughs> and that I can't take too much of the other thing. And I'm also sure that's one reason I'm drawn to Emerson. Like it's a, it's a temperamental attraction to the kind of person that he is. And I should say that psychologically, I think he could be quite astute in his self-diagnosis. I think he felt both impulses on a, uh, the level of, of neediness almost, that his whole philosophical understanding was built on being alone. And if you know, if you read his essays on friendship or on love, in a way they're completely crazy because, <laughs> I mean, they have some beautiful lines in them. He, he's, the, particularly the, the essay about love is, is almost very frisky in a way. He says all the world loves the lover in there and things like that, which almost don't sound like Emerson to me. They're so kind of smiling and positive thinking about love. But, um, his essay about friendship is basically like, if you followed it, you would never have any friends. <laughs> it's, it's almost like friendship is so precious that you must never contaminate it with the real world. If you see your friend cross the street and don't ever meet his family. I mean, it's literally on a level of crazy because he wanted to preserve a kind of transcendental purity to friendship. But at the same time, I think he was aware that he drove people away, right? And he was unhappy about it because some part of him did respond to the warmth of other people and yearn for it. He, he has this famous phrase about the porcupine impossibility of contact with other human beings. And he felt like he suffered from it, but he knew it. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. He was fully aware of this kind of Arctic frigidity in his, in his person. And he regretted it and he could not overcome it. And I think that actually shows a very extraordinary level of self-consciousness and self-analysis for that era. I don't think everybody had, even brilliant people didn't always have that, but he, he had it in, in spades, I think. Yeah, I think I can also identify with that part of him and the porcupine yeah, well, me too. personality. <laughs> that may be, maybe that's one of the ultimate identifying signs of the great Masonic fraternity of Emerson readers, that they all... <laughs> feel a little bit of that distance from other people and not really wanting it, but feeling a little condemned to it, but being aware of that there's, a, there's some poignance to it. I, like Emerson definitely felt it. And you see in it, I mean, in the book that I'm writing, there's a chapter that's basically about his view of friendship. So I do talk about that essay that I was just discussing with you. 
and then for my specimens of friends, I chose his friendship with Thoreau, which is a very important one to him, and his friendship with Margaret Fuller. The friendship with Fuller is a little different because there is some element of man-woman energy in there. Yeah. And Fuller was very attached to Emerson and just wanted, and he was a married man. I mean, it's not, he, wasn't, he wasn't a single dude at that point in his life, but they had an intense intellectual rapport, which was cer certainly an emotional one as well. And, and Fuller sort of wanted more and, and she pressed him for a more intimate relationship. And it's not really clear exactly how much he was pressing for, but there's a famous thing in Emerson's diary where he says like, you know, what, what do you want me to love? Do you want me to love your body? The supposition disgusts you. And I mean, he doesn't say you, comma, Margaret Fuller, but it's very clear that that's who he's talking about. And I don't think that therefore Margaret Fuller was sort of pushing him down on a bed of pine cones, you know, and trying to impose herself on him sexually, but she really wanted a kind of intense loving relationship with, from him. And he thought she was an amazing person, clearly, but he couldn't give her what she wanted. And there's this weird tug of war as you read about the relationship. And then, you know, it's very true also that I think Emerson's friendship with Thoreau is certainly a kind of a love story in a way. Partially because I think both men had some degree of sort of homoerotic interest in their makeup. I mean, Thoreau never was involved with anybody. And I think it's much more accepted that he was probably mostly a closeted gay man. I mean, closeted in the sense of never having really had a romantic or sexual life. Emerson, of course, married twice, had children, was very much a domesticated male who appeared, you know, completely heterosexual to the world. And, but, you know, there's a very famous, he was infatuated with one of the, a fellow male student when he was at Harvard, and he wrote these very lovey-dovey swooning uh, entries in his journal about this person, who was named Martin Gay, actually. I don't think Emerson and Thoreau had a homosexual relationship in any way, except maybe in the intensity of their intimate attraction to each other, but, but it was a hugely important relationship to both of them. And early on, because Thoreau was younger, he was very much the disciple, and he wanted to walk like Emerson and talk like him and dress like him. And Emerson just adored him and invited him to come live at his house. In some ways, as a substitute for moving to some communitarian farm, he said, well, at least I'll have other people live in my house. Yeah. So Thoreau lived there and was kind of like a mini me version of Emerson at first. <laughs> and Emerson viewed him as a kind of combination of disciple, substitute son, personal trainer. Uh, <laughs> you know, because, because Thoreau was very good with his hands. He knew how to do all sorts of things. And Emerson was a little bit more of a klutz in that way. So Thoreau would teach him how to kind of, how to hoe and graft apple trees and things like that. And Emerson really felt like he was finally getting some real, you know, cardio and getting a workout. And he clearly loved Thoreau. As Thoreau matured and moved out of Emerson's orbit in certain ways and found his own voice as a writer, which took a while, I think the master and disciple relationship began to crumble and neither of these people was really sure how to replace it. And it was kind of a tragedy, I think. You read their journals of the time, their writings about each other, and a kind of just contempt and near hatred creeps into it. And, and I think it's the intensity of dislike you have for someone that you love. You know, you wouldn't feel that intensely about someone who was just a casual friend. But it's, and again, and again even in his relationships with particular people, it's a miniature version of his relationship to society. There's an intense need for intimacy and closeness with these people. And then in, invariably they enter into a kind of minefield where that intimacy is too much. They did tire of each other, but then of course they, they lived in Concord. They still saw each other all the time. At the end of Thoreau's life, when he was on his deathbed, on a few occasions, Emerson would go down to Walden. He would check the um, thickness and springiness of the ice and things like that. And he would come to visit with Thoreau and he would give him a sort of bulletin. I find that extraordinarily moving and beautiful because in a way he had become a kind of um, proxy for Thoreau's own beautiful investigation of this place. He was bringing in updates and in some ways advancing the project of Walden, the book, when Thoreau could no longer do it. And of course it was Emerson who insisted that the town have this elaborate funeral service for Thoreau where he was 
you know, his casket was covered with, with flowers and branches. And Emerson gave his eulogy. I don't, I'll, I don't want to go on too much longer in this obsessive vein, but I thought about this a lot, that Emerson gave this very famous eulogy, which then was an article published in The Atlantic. But even in his funeral eulogy, he could not resist taking a few shots at Thoreau. I mean, most of it is very beautiful and laudatory and, and loving, but they're just, he could not stop due to the, his own crazy ambivalence. So he was a divided person like all of us are. Um, and this was very much symptomatic of the thing you and I were talking about of like needing people and recoiling from people. It's fascinating. I mean, these relationships are so fascinating. And I believe actually that, um, God, I'm forgetting his name. The director who made Boyhood, terrible I'm forgetting this guy's name. He's made, he's made a million movies. He's making a Concord movie now. Oh, wow. He's wanted to do it for a long time. His name will come to me. And I believe that Ethan Hawke is going to play Emerson in this movie. Oh, wow. Not 100% sure I think that's a good casting idea, but um, let's see what happens. I mean, Hawke did just play John Brown uh, in that other movie. So maybe he's just gonna work his way through all the great sort of <laughs> mid 19th century figures of America. Um, that's very interesting. What will the film be focused on, do you know? You know, I don't know. I mean, by the way, I feel like a complete senior citizen that I'm not remembering. He's a very well-known filmmaker. Is, that a, is it Terrence Malick or? No, it's not Terrence Malick. It's the guy who made, who made Boyhood, which was shot over a sequence of years with this same boy who was literally yeah. growing up. This guy has made so many movies. I'm just blocking on it. But I had read in a New, York, New Yorker article about him some time ago that he had grown up, he had been raised as a Unitarian himself. And um, that had given him some degree of fascination with the whole world of American Unitarianism and the great writers who came out of it. And that he wanted to make an Emerson movie and that his great concern was how do you do it without making a kind of stiff masterpiece theater, frock coats and carriages, period piece. And that's a, that's a legitimate concern to worry about because a lot of those things are like that. And I remember him saying, I'd really like to talk to a bunch of Emerson, convene a meeting of Emerson scholars and Emersonians to maybe talk about that great riddle, how you do it. And thinking at the time, I would gladly sign on to be a consultant with your movie. I just had a chance to Google him. It's uh, Richard Linkletter. That's right. That's exactly what it was. Okay, I'm really sorry I couldn't figure this out before, but... Um, <laughs> I love the idea of him making it, uh, an Emerson movie. I don't know if it's Emerson is the absolute star and everyone else is subsidiary, or is it kind of an amazing Concord soap opera, a kind of patent place set in Concord where you have Bronson Alcott and you know Thoreau and, and Margaret Fuller and Emerson and, and all of the amazing and eminent people who just flowed through that town that was like kind of the Athens of America for a brief shining moment. I mean, there's a constellation of people who are both, genius. oh, and Hawthorne, let's not have been Hawthorne. Yeah. Constellation of people who are both geniuses and just really strange human beings. Um, <laughs> and to me, that's like the recipe for a great movie or like, to me, it'd be a great six part mini series. Yeah. Um, not that anyone is consulting with me on this, but um, I'm very excited to, to see this thing and also inwardly groaning at how, how wrong it could go. Um, <laughs> That's exciting news. Um, yeah. Hopefully you'll find a contact with that director and get in on this. I would love to, but at the very least, I'd love to see it. And um, well, anyway, I mean, I, not much more to add to that, but um, they are amazing personalities. I mean, yeah. if you, once you dive into that world, it's very hard not to become fascinated by Thoreau or by Margaret Fuller or by Bronson Alcott, who is not as important as those people as a writer, but he's utterly fascinating as a personality and as an exponent of those ideas of the time. And also as just frankly a comic figure. And also, you know, as the father of Louisa May Alcott. And, and, and you know, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's an amazing world, an amazing microcosm. And I've spent many years now productively paddling around it. I can scarcely imagine, you know, when I'm done with Emerson, Will I then exit that world and have to inhabit something else? You know, I don't really know. When I was starting my book, I wrote to Robert D. Richardson, the you know, great biographer of mm -hmm. Emerson, and of Thoreau, 
Because actually Annie Dillard, his wife, had been my first writing teacher. So I at least had a way to write and get his email address, and, which I did. And I wrote to him and I said, first of all, I love your books. He wrote a, he wrote a great biography of William James as well. He's just an amazing writer altogether. Yes. And he grew up in Concord. So anyway, I wrote to him and just said, I'm writing this book about Emerson. I owe much of my Emersonianism to your, to your wife, Annie Dillard, who was my teacher. But um, would you mind if from time to time I, I asked you a question? And, you know, his, his Emerson book was ye- years and years before. And he said to me, I'd be happy to talk about Emerson with you. I'm never done with him. And I, I found that incredibly touching that he was henceforth going to occupy that universe along with the overlapping universes of William James and Thoreau. And oh, he had a million other interests, I'm sure. So, I mean, I may be a lifetime inhabitant of, you know, the Emersonian universe, but I mean, there's other things I want to write about. So we'll see if I can, you know, engineer an escape every now and then. I, there's a nonstop Emersonian chat room kind of going in my head. All the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and maybe it's unhealthy at that point, but... Um, but he offers you that plenitude of thought and emotion and beautiful language. There's, there's enough fuel there for, you know, a hundred years of fire. So I just sort of keep it going. Yeah. That's great. Well, James, I definitely feel you. I resonate with what you're saying and I'm looking forward to your book. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Living from the Soul. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, subscribe, and review. This is an ad-free podcast brought to you by my books, which are available at samtarode.com. The theme music was created by Gideon Tarode.